This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hey, this is Jason Crowell with Norton Neuroscience Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks for listening to today's Neurology Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Chris Gibbons. Chris is a neurologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and we're discussing a paper that he recently co-authored, published in the journal Neurology on April 11th. The title of the paper is Cutaneous Alpha-Synuclein Signatures in Patients with Multiple System Atrophy and Parkinson Disease. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Jason, thank you very much for having me. Before we get started, I want to mention that we're going to be discussing a skin test for phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. I don't believe we have discussed this on the podcast, at least not recently. This test is commercially available through a company, CND Life Sciences, and we just want to acknowledge that, similar to Chris's disclosure in the paper, that Chris serves as a scientific advisor to this company and also has stock options in the company. All right, so Chris, we'll talk more about this skin test, but just let's get the headline first. Can you start by explaining maybe in just, just one or two sentences what it is that you're reporting in this paper? What we're really looking at is, can we detect phosphorylated alpha-synuclein in the skin? And, you know, the headline is, yes, we can. And, and in patients with synucleinopathies, and in this paper, Parkinson's disease and MSA, we can detect phosphorylated alpha-synuclein in the skin, but not in healthy control subjects. And the other major headline is that there's a different pattern between these two diseases. MSA looks pathologically very different than Parkinson's disease in the skin, and it's that cutaneous signature that allows us to really differentiate between the disorders. Terrific. So let's maybe start by having you explain, if you don't mind, the skin test. So many in our audience may be familiar with this test by now, but again, I don't believe we've discussed on the podcast. So can you please describe what's involved in these skin biopsies and how it is currently being used clinically? For those of us who've been involved in the peripheral nerve field, skin biopsies have really been clinically available for several decades, really in the realm of small fiber neuropathy testing. And so using a standard three millimeter punch biopsy, you take small pieces of skin and you're able to study the skin uh, under a microscope and look at the nerves within the skin samples and really identify whether there's the presence or absence of nerves that would indicate perhaps a neuropathy. But we discovered over time that proteins can be detected within these axons in the skin. So in this case, phosphorylated alpha-synuclein can be seen within the axons in these skin biopsies. And so we've been able to discover that using this technique, we can identify this this abnormal or phosphorylated form of alpha-synuclein and confirm that in patients with synucleinopathies, we see this. I mean, this has been studied in Parkinson's disease, MSA, dementia with Lewy bodies, and pure autonomic failure. And so we can really use the standard punch biopsy as a way to detect this. And so having phosphorylated alpha-synuclein in these biopsies is sensitive, but not necessarily specific for a certain synucleinopathy, right? So if you have this phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, it would suggest there's some synucleinopathy, but just the presence of it doesn't necessarily specify which synucleinopathy. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So traditionally, when we see phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, it tells us that, yes, that that abnormal protein is now present in, in whatever tissue source we're looking at. But as we know, the categories of synucleinopathies include Parkinson's, multiple system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, pure autonomic failure, and of course the prodromal states, which can include most typically REM sleep behavior disorder, amongst other kind of prodromal conditions. And in prior work, with our group and others, we know that the phosphorylated synuclein can be detected across all of these diseases. And in this particular paper, our our question was really, is there a pathological signature that helps to differentiate amongst these different subtypes of synucleinopathy? And so if I may try and summarize here, in this study, you took cohorts of individuals with multiple system atrophy, Parkinson disease, and healthy controls, and you compared a couple of things, right? So you compared their immunohistochemistry on skin biopsy, how much phosphorylated synuclein they had, as well as the topographical distribution. So where was the phosphorylated synuclein located in terms of the location of the skin biopsies? And then you also compared nerve fiber density. So before we get into the data, just one question about what was your gold standard for categorizing Parkinson's disease versus multiple system atrophy in these individuals? 
So we used clinical diagnosis using probable criteria, but we supplemented this with a number of additional ancillary tests. So all of the the groups had expertise, uh, both in movement disorders and autonomic disorders. And so all the individuals were not of the equivocal category. These were, you know, really clinically confirmed cases with supplemental autonomic testing, as well as ancillary tests. Some had cardiac MIBG scans and other things to help really confirm firm our best clinical estimate of the diagnosis. So it was really, that was the gold standard. These were not autopsy cases. So what did you find when you looked at these results? When you gathered the data, what did you find when you compared these results in, in these different cohorts of patients? What was different about their immunohistochemical results with regards to phosphorylated synuclein? What was different about their nerve fiber density? The interesting thing about skin biopsies is traditionally we've just been thinking of them as a way to look at nerves in the skin, and and that's sort of the end result. What we're beginning to learn is there is a lot of information, and what I'm going to try and tell you is a little bit of the story of discovery that we've used in this process. So in these particular cohorts, we did three skin biopsies. We did one by the neck and then two sites in the leg, a proximal and a distal site. And we discovered that these three biopsy locations and prior work are useful in capturing the vast majority of patients with synucleinopathy. Now, we do understand and have previously noted that there were different patterns to the topographical distribution. So in other words, if I did a skin biopsy on the neck, that might be more likely to be abnormal in a patient for example, with Parkinson's disease, whereas le- sites on the leg may be less likely to be uh, containing phosphorylated alpha synuclein. However, we'd noticed that MSA didn't seem to follow that pattern in the same way. So these were, were theories that we had going into this study. And so we did these three skin biopsies, and we quantified the amount of synuclein in each of the biopsies. And to our surprise, the synucleinopathy with the most deposition was actually multiple system atrophy. And this was a bit shocking to us because theoretically MSA is a central synucleinopathy. And so traditionally we would have expected very low to no phosphorylated alpha synuclein in the skin. But in contrast, we found far more, exponentially greater amounts of synuclein across all three biopsies. And so when compared to Parkinson's disease, there really was a logarithmic increase in synuclein deposition. And in Parkinson's disease, we did identify this um, in the vast majority of patients as well. So we had 54 subjects who we tested and 51 contained alpha synuclein. So the vast majority had phosphorylated alpha synuclein in Parkinson's, but it was just to a much smaller degree when we quantify this result. In contrast, all of the patients with MSA had phosphorylated alpha synuclein, and the amount was much greater. And so when we talk about topographic distribution, we tried to express this in a way that was mathematically viable. So we looked at the the different body sites, the neck and then the two sites and the leg, and we used a proximal to distal gradient as a way to really identify where the synuclein was deposited. So if you had your synuclein just in the neck region, that would be given a score of one. And if we had just had it at the lower site on the leg, that would be a score of negative one. And if it was sort of balanced evenly across, it would be a score of zero. So you can imagine sort of this proximal, which is plus one, to to distal, which is minus one gradient. And what we found is that in Parkinson's disease, the gradient was predominantly at the neck, sort of as we had noted previously, but this really confirmed it in this study. The neck seemed to be the vast majority of cases with Parkinson's disease. In contrast, MSA was much more widespread and so had a distribution that was much closer to zero, which in indicated that was evenly spread across all three biopsies. So with that information, we started to really see separation between groups. So if we were analyzing how much synuclein and the topographic distribution, that really allowed us to separate MSA from Parkinson's disease with really greater than 90% confidence. But we could also look at additional information in these skin biopsies. They contain small sensory fibers, the intraepidermal nerve fibers. They also contain autonomic innervation. So we looked at these different categories of nerves. And we also found that in Parkinson's disease, there tended to be a mild but length-dependent small fiber neuropathy that was present. 
This was not seen in patients with MSA. And so this was another feature of the biopsy that we could incorporate into our algorithm to help separate between these two groups or kind of subtypes of synucleinopathy. And so we could really see that the patients with Parkinson's disease were proximal predominant, lower levels of synuclein, and associated with a neuropathy, whereas MSA was more widespread, greater amounts, and no associated neuropathy. So given these pathologic features, what we're calling a biosignature allowed us to really separate between these groups very effectively. And so it was greater than 95% sensitivity and specificity to separate between these groups, kind of using this multiple layered approach of pathology. Of course, we do think that given these patients being very well characterized, you know, not the, the groups of individuals that we're debating about, this will certainly be harder to do in, you know, those overlap cases or more challenging cases. And we think that's where the clinical features may continue to play a role. So we can add in clinical features about age, perhaps some autonomic function testing or cognitive testing, you know, various other metrics might be, you know, incorporated in such a thing. Things like the University of Pennsylvania smell identification test, the upset, all of these are, are additional features that really could provide ways to help separate between groups. Wow. So really incredible to think about potentially having a test that we can do for patients to try to answer this question that we so often wrestle with in clinic. Is this typical Parkinson's disease or is this some atypical form, specifically multiple system atrophy? I want to ask you to expand on something that you mentioned, and I apologize in advance because this may just be me revealing my limited understanding of pathology, but can you talk a bit more about why these two synucleinopathies might have different topographic differences. So again, in Parkinson's individuals, it was primarily proximal exclusively. In individuals with multiple system atrophy, it was more widespread. Why, again, might their pathology explain that topographic difference? These are ongoing areas of investigation. We have a couple of theories about why that might occur. So we understand or begin to understand the pathology, but it really allows us, I think, to ask some of these excellent questions about why this is occurring. So certainly in patients with MSA, we know that in the central nervous system, glial cytoplasmic inclusions are the hallmark characteristic of this, as opposed to kind of Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites that we see in Parkinson's and in dementia with Lewy bodies. So we know that the synuclein, as it accumulates, the diseases separate a little bit pathologically in the central nervous system, and perhaps that carries as well into the peripheral nervous system. We do see different subsets of nerves involved. And so one of the key things we do is ensure that the phosphorylated alpha synuclein we're looking at is intraaxonal. So we want to make sure we're not picking up some artifact or you know something in the tissue. So we're ensuring that it is intraaxonal, which means we can then identify which nerve types are involved. And so one of the unique features in MSA is that the subepidermal plexus is involved. Now, if you're imagining a piece of skin, the very superficial layer, the epidermis, is where we find a host of small unmyelinated nerve fibers that tell us about pain and temperature. And just below that layer is something called the subepidermal plexus. It's a big array of nerves that run just beneath the epidermis and sends these small unmyelinated fibers up through the skin. In patients with MSA, we saw a fair proportion, you know, the vast majority had some subepidermal plexus involvement. And in patients with Parkinson's disease, we really didn't see that to the same degree. So it was only a very small percentage. Um, and that, you know, does raise questions of, again, could we be misdiagnosing these two different groups? Absolutely. And so these, these patterns are starting to really give us some understanding that the pathology does differ between these groups. And that certainly patients with MSA, we know it's a more aggressive, rapidly fatal disease. And so we, we wouldn't be surprised to, to anticipate that synuclein propagation occurs more quickly. And so as we look at these nerve fibers, we see that the synuclein doesn't tend to spread across the axon. It really spreads up and down the axon. Let me ask you, you've talked about some of these already, but what lingering questions do you have now about the different distributions of this alpha synuclein deposition individuals with Parkinson's versus multiple system atrophy? Where do you turn next? <laughs> 
With this information, I think it, it really allows us to start to think about the array and range of diagnoses. And these are some of the questions, of course, that we do want to ask because we're looking at the two subtypes that I think most people struggle with, Parkinson's and multiple system atrophy. But dementia with Lewy bodies is in this category as well. And in fact, maybe one of the most commonly misdiagnosed with MSA in part because of the severe autonomic failure that's associated. So I think incorporating additional information amongst other groups and trying to understand, can all of these be differentiated, including pure autonomic failure, which as some of you may be aware of, has a a reasonably high phenoconversion risk over enough time. And so these patients who present with pure autonomic failure, perhaps this is just another prodromal synucleinopathy like REM sleep behavior disorder, where over enough time, the, the phenoconversion risk to some other synucleinopathy becomes very high. And so looking at prodromal states and potential prediction and modeling, you know, does a pattern predict what phenoconversion, you know, might be like in the future would be a really interesting question. So those are areas we're we're certainly looking at. We do have actually another very large study that's just coming to conclusion. It's still blinded at this time, but will be presented at the American Academy of Neurology this year. And we're looking at all four synucleinopathy groups and trying to understand whether these signatures between groups really do differ in such a way that we can distinguish all four based on the pathology alone. You know, that may be a tall task, but we're optimistic that at least some signal will separate between all of these groups. Terrific, Chris. I think it's pretty obvious how this might be very clinically useful in terms of trying to give patients more accurate diagnoses and narrow the differential, both now and and especially looking forward as we hope for disease-modifying treatments for these different diseases. So really exciting to learn more about this and look forward to seeing the data you and your team present at the annual meeting. Thank you. Certainly, you know, these are early times in this analysis. And so as people ask us questions about if I do a biopsy in my patient, what does this tell me? We're still at the point where we're we're being cautiously optimistic about the information we learn. And so I know people are very excited to, to get full answers, but just acknowledging that this is again an early study and we have plenty of work to do, but we are excited to continue to try and, you know, learn more as we go forward. Terrific. Well, Chris, thanks so much. I've been speaking with Chris Gibbons. He's at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and we've been discussing the paper he co-authored that is out in this week's journal, Neurology, titled Cutaneous Alpha-Synuclein Signatures in Patients with Multiple System Atrophy and Parkinson Disease. Chris, thanks so much. Jason, thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening. And for letting us join you on your commute, while you're exercising, or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.